Welcome to Comic Book News. I'm your old pal, Dan Shaheen. Today, we're very excited. Uh, we're going to talk to Bill Morrison, uh, one of the co-founders of Bongo Comics, which created the great Simpsons comics, uh, as well as many others. We're going to talk to him about that. We're going to talk to him about his time at Mad Magazine. And uh, man, anything else that comes up along the way. Uh, first, a little bit of show business. Thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Um, Please, if you haven't already, consider hitting that subscribe button. If you like this video, hey, click that thumbs up. If you don't, you can click thumbs down. Just please make sure, give us a comment down below. Let us know what I'm doing wrong, what I could do a little bit different. Um, fantastic. If you want to see your comics here on our world-famous Million Dollar Comics Cam, there's only one place to send them. It's to the Million Dollar Mailbox, P.O. Box 1163, Arcata, California. 95518. Arcata, California is very beautiful. I recommend if you've never come here, come check us out. What we're lacking in comics, we more than make up for in natural beauty. Speaking of natural beauties, next week we're going to talk to Chris Staros, the editor in chief of Top Shelf. Man, Chris, uh, Chris's company publishes my all time favorite graphic novel, From Hell by Alan Moore and Eddie Campbell. We've talked to Eddie Campbell here on this show. Someday, I hope maybe we can talk to Alan Moore. That would be amazing. But until then, uh, we're going to talk to today's guest. We're going to talk to Bill Morrison. Uh, let's talk to him. But before we do, uh, we got to change venues. Let's go. Well, I think you know where we're going to go. To the bat poles. Or maybe not. Today, we're in Springfield instead of the Bat Cave in honor of our guest. So let's bring in uh, today's guest. Without further ado, here he is, Mr. Bill Morrison. Hey. Hey. Welcome to Comic Book News. Thank you, Dan. How are you doing? Fantastic. Thanks for making the time to be here. I really well, appreciate it. It's my pleasure. And you're in uh, California, right? Correct. Uh, I'm in uh, Arcata, California, up in Humboldt know. County, far northern California. Yeah. Well, how about I yourself? I'm in uh, St. Clair Shores, Michigan, which if people don't know where that is, it's north of Detroit by a little bit. And it's on Lake St. Clair, which is not one of the Great Lakes, but it's a huge lake. Uh, it's so big. And I'm right on the lake. So I'm looking out my studio window here and I can the lake is just beyond my backyard. Oh, and uh, on a very, very clear day, I can almost see Canada. So that's how, big oh, and, the, and, that's how big the lake is. Oh, you got a not so great lake right outside of your window. Yeah. That's fantastic. Uh, how do you like, are you close to what, Dearborn? I've been to Detroit a couple times. Yeah, I mean, well, Dearborn is um, kind of on the west, southwest side of Detroit. Um, but it's, I don't know, it's maybe half an hour away. You got a lot of good comic stores in your area? We actually have an excellent one in Dearborn. We have the Green Brain. Uh, if anyone's ever heard of the Green Brain, they're they're an excellent, excellent comic shop. They're one of those Dan shops. Merritt, that, I think, right? Yeah, he's, Dan he's, Merritt. he's one of the greats. And they carry everything. Um, they're really big on you know like foreign stuff, pretty much any graphic novel you can think of. Um, but they also have all the mainstream stuff that you would expect. It's not like a it's not like a toy or collectible centric shop. It's really all about the comics and the books. I, I've never been there, but it's one of those ones that's on my list of like, that's my kind of store. Um, yeah. Literally I had a store. We didn't carry toys and that kind of stuff. It was, it was all about the full breadth of comics. Yeah. Um, did now you ever go to comic relief in Berkeley? Yes. I've been there. Um, 
Uh, I think I was at uh, like maybe WonderCon when WonderCon was up in San Francisco. Yeah, those were. And I think days. we had a party there, or um, you know, it might have been like an after dinner kind of trip to the comic shop. That was a that's a Green Brain level store for sure. Rest yeah. in peace, Rory Root. That's a great one. Yeah. I, now there is another shop in Allen Park, which is right next to Dearborn, and um, it does have a lot of toys, but it's huge. It's Big Ben's Comics Oasis, and I love that shop because they've got they've got all the new stuff. They've got like new things like pop figures and action figures, but they've also got a lot of old toys and collectibles, which I love, and tons of old comics. So they have like like a huge section of back issues. Um, they're not priced through the roof, so you can just sit there and kind of root through boxes and find really good stuff. So those are my two kind of go-to shops here. Awesome. Well, let's talk about your, your, your career in comics. How did you get started drawing comics? I know you went to, uh, you went to art school, right? Yes. I went, uh, I actually grew up here in the Detroit area and I went to the, uh, at the time it was called the center for creative studies. Now it's an official college. So it's the college for creative studies now in Detroit. And, I always wanted to be a comic book artist. So sort of going into art school, that was my goal. But at the time, everything was in New York. All the publishers were in New York. You know, if you wanted to get a, your start in comics, you ask pretty much any, any uh, comic book artist or writer who's around my age who got their start when they were like college age or, or slightly older, um, they all went to New York. They all lived there or lived outside New York. And that was what you had to do. There was no other way around it. Once you got established, you could move elsewhere and then, you know, like mail stuff in. Were you discouraged by your art school teachers from pursuing cartooning? We've heard those stories before. Um, not really. They were, um, and at the time I would always try, like I would get an assignment and I would always try to, solve the assignment with a comic book solution um if that makes sense you know yeah. I, I was always trying to keep doing comics even though maybe the assignment wasn't specifically a comic assignment so i was always trying, trying to the work comics angle or whatever yeah. anatomy or still life or whatever you'd find a comics yeah if i was if i had to do a, a life drawing i would put the figure in a spider-man costume you know yeah <laughs> stuff like that um but i i didn't get a i don't think i remember getting a lot of um criticism from my instructors on that um i mean they were real supportive and they would i think they would try to push me in the direction of more illustration you know like showing me illustrators that i might not have been familiar with um kind of pushing me that way but because Which is probably was, great, even for a, as a cartoonist too, right? To be exposed to all these other oh, yeah. non comic book influences. Yeah, if I I think if I had gone in, because at that time there was no class specifically on comics at the school. If I had gone in, just thinking, you know, like with a closed mind, this is all I want to do, I would have been miserable. But I was. I think I was already influenced by Salvador Dali and Norman Rockwell and, um, you know, kind of photorealism. Uh, so when I actually got an airbrush class and I started doing paintings that were, you know, kind of um, with the subject matter that I was into, I had this, I had this instructor, Gary Ciccarelli, and he was an excellent airbrush painter and he was really into the whole California airbrush style so the stuff that you would see on album covers and movie posters back then um real kind of stylized glamorized uh, led zeppelin logo uh, yeah airbrushed metal everything with chrome and neon and chrome and pink california script on top of it or something like and that palm trees and yeah girls on roller skates and all that kind of stuff which is totally back in style now, that particular aesthetic. I'm seeing it all mm -hmm. over advertising and stuff as a retro aesthetic. Yeah, and I still do it. So I'm uh, I'm trying to sort of put it out there that, hey, I can do this. And, 
because I'm freelancing. Oh. Okay, so 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 cartooning school or, or, or art school rather, but focused on cartooning. Yeah, but but I had a fear of New York, and I I think because I grew up in the era of uh, Martin Scorsese movies and seventies cop shows that were just like Homer. Yeah, I was like, New York is a terrifying place. I don't want to go there. It's crime ridden, and yeah. I'd seen the out of towners with Jack Lemon, you know, when he gets mug, you know, his first night in New York. And I'm like, ah, no. So I ended up going to the other coast and I, I, um, right out of art school, I had a job at a place in the Detroit area doing technical illustration. So it was like line drawings of yes. automobile parts, very precise, very boring. Um, but in my spare time, evenings and weekends, I would work on my portfolio. So after I had a pretty good portfolio, I took a vacation, took a week, and I went out to California, to Hollywood. And I just showed my portfolio around, and I ended up getting a job as the in-house illustrator at uh, sort of a boutique ad agency that catered to the film industry. And um, so it was great because I was – working on a lot of big films in in kind of a small way. So I would do like the concept sketches. Our director would come into my office in my cubicle area and say, you know, I need I need 20 concept sketches for this movie. Here's the videotape, you know, sit down and watch it and then, you know, give me some ideas. As in concept sketches for advertisements. For advertising, for a poster, poster design. Okay. What's one we might, what's a movie we might know that, that you worked on? Um, well, I, I can give you some of the big ones that I worked on in this sort of small way. Yeah. Um, Princey's Honor was one. That was a Jack Nicholson film. Mm -hmm. um, Supergirl. Supergirl movie. Worked on that. Um, Return of the Living Dead. Um, those are just three off the top of my head. But... Right. Because I was in house, which was unusual for California, because most artists were freelancers. Most of these agencies didn't have a guy or a girl working in house, like was common in Detroit. Um, so I, they were kind of trying it out, trying out this idea of having somebody there all the time that they could throw stuff to. And because I knew my way around an airbrush, I could do photo retouching. I remember retouching a, a James Bond 007 poster with Sean Connery. Um, that was um, his comeback. That was uh, Never Say Never Again. And um, they needed they needed like a different format because I think it was a European poster and they needed to have it expanded to a different uh, aspect mm -hmm. ratio. So I had to like extend the background and I had to add like there was an explosion, I had to like add that. And um, I could do stuff like that because I knew how to use an airbrush. So I became yeah. an asset to them. And also every time a low budget job would come into the studio, they could save money by having me do it instead of giving it to a freelancer. So I got to do, you know, a lot of uh, teen sex comedies, um, a lot the of best kind movies. of sex comedy. Yeah. Well, you don't want, you know, octogenarian sex right. comedies. Just don't. They don't fly. <laughs> Although I did see a good one uh, recently. So I don't know. There's a pro there's a probably a couple. It can be done. Um. So anyway, it was it was great. And, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but this would have been early to mid '80s, based on those right. properties that you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. So it was really great for them. And it was great for me because I got to work on some big campaigns, but I also got to sort of cut my teeth on doing finished posters for smaller movies that didn't have as much at stake in terms of, you know, like if the artwork, if the final illustration wasn't Drew Struzan quality, nobody was upset about it. <laughs> They kind of knew what they were getting with me because I was young and I was still learning. Um, probably the biggest one that I did, the most, um, it was kind of a big movie. And it was, um, um, 
it got a lot of attention because of the image. And that was the movie House. Oh, great movie. With William Cat and yeah. uh, Gwen. John Ratzenberger, right? John Ratzenberger. So the image that I did was of this decayed, rotting, severed hand pushing a doorbell on the side of a like a real weathered looking house, kind of a clapboard house. And, uh, you know, so I went out, you know, I went out in the parking lot and I got someone to photograph my hand and then I just kind of screwed it up. You know, I just used my imagination and figured out like, what would this hand look like if it was rotting and, you know, in the, it was set at the wrist, you know, like what would be hanging out veins and tendons and things. And, um, I wasn't going for any like medical reference or anything. I was just kind of making it up and it was believable. People bought it. People were like, wow, that's, that's a gnarly image. And, um, it, they ended up using it also for the video cassette packaging, which is where I think most people, people saw it. A lot of kids saw it. Um, people who were kids back in the eighties, because a lot of them are friends of mine now when they find out, when they find out that I did that painting, their minds are blown because they're like, Oh my uh -huh. God, you know, I, I rented that video or I pestered my mom to get it and she wouldn't let me get it. So I had to sneak it. And there it is. Yeah, that's it. That took me a second. Sorry about that. <laughs> Can you get that on full screen? Boop. How about that? Yeah. So that's, that's my hand. I always tell people I just didn't moisturize for about a week. And, uh, <laughs> Love it, man. Hey, let's get uh, that hand. Yeah, so I did stuff like that. I did, um, there was a movie called Choose Me, which was a foreign film that I did. There was one called The Hit, which had John, um, John Hurt, I think, was in that. No, not John Hurt. I can't remember. Um, so like a lot of foreign films. They were having like a U.S. release and they didn't have a big budget to do a, you know, big poster campaign like they would normally. Um, so I did that and that was where I met Matt Groening, who at the time was a um, struggling cartoonist. He was doing Life in Hell. And uh, one of his side gigs was writing copy for movie posters. Oh, really? So yeah. So the first. Hey, Bill, if you don't mind, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, show a few more images. So I'm gonna increase the size here of my of my thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, the first sort of collaboration that we had. What was that? Was that, Alan Moore? <laughs> that was my Alan Moore stinger. <laughs> wow. I love yeah, your opening, so... by the way, because I'm a big Batman fan. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was fun. Oh, no. Um, okay. So the our first sort of collaboration was I did a painting for a movie called Blood Diner. And Matt actually wrote the copy line for the poster. So it's the first instance where you see my artwork coupled with Matt Groening's writing. Which one? Which movie was that? I'm sorry. Blood Diner. Awesome. That and that's great. The copy line was first they meet you, then they eat you. <laughs> okay, wait a minute. I got you should be able to find that one. It's pretty it's a pretty popular that might that might that might take me a minute, but um yeah. so how was it working with Graining from from the beginning? This was during this had to be during his um life in hell years. Yeah. Like you were saying. Admitting. So Guy was working as an alternative cartoonist, right? Uh, in, in in these alt weeklies, not probably paying a ton of money, but he was putting out some of the funniest, yeah, cartoons ever um, at that time. Yeah, I was a you know I was a fan. I don't think I'd seen Life in Hell until I got to California, but once I did, it was in the L.A. Reader and then in the L.A. Weekly. So I um. You know, I read it every chance I got. And eventually, um, 
the, the way that I met Matt was we had an art director at the agency and she was friends with him. So she's the one that actually brought him in to write copy for the posters. And um, so I'm just seeing your message here. I'm using um, Google Chrome. Yeah, that's good. I thought that's why you were having a trouble connecting. That was a, that was a, before you, you connected. Oh, okay. That's an old message then. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry about that one. Okay, sorry about that. Um, no worries. So anyway, um, Matt would... Um, I, I knew him at this point because I would see him come in for meetings. Um, so I didn't know him well, but I you know, kind of knew who he was. And I remember on a few occasions, he would call this art director friend. Her name was Millie Smythe. And she would say, hey, Matt's working on his latest Life and Health strip. And this week it's about like childhood songs, like songs we sang as a kid where we made up lyrics to popular songs or whatever. And so she kind of would pull the office to see, you know, if anybody had something he could use. And I remember my contribution was as a kid, I used to sing the Popeye the Sailor song, but the lyrics were changed to, I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. I live in a garbage can. Oh, yes. I eat all the worms and spit out the germs. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. And um, that was one he hadn't thought of. So he put it in the strip. So like, you know, a week or two later, I see the Life and Hell strip and like, hey, there's my song. Uh -huh. I mean, not that I wrote it, but that was my right. contribution. So it was kind of cool. There were, there were a few times when um, he did strips about you know, things that we did as kids and, um, and we would, you know, the office would get pulled and, and we would contribute. Um, so that, so that was, I was really fun. And that made me even more interested in the strip. So I used to, I remember I used to clip it out and I would post, you know, like if it related to something, some, some friend was going through at the office, I would like, cut out a, a strip and post it on their door or put it up on the bulletin board in the break room or something like that. It was, you know, it was a big cultural thing, like a big pre Simpsons cultural thing to um, reference life in hell. Sure. This book, the book was amazing. The comics were amazing. In fact, do you want to take, we could dip in for a second and take a look at a couple strips cool. over here in the million dollar comics cam. Hang on a second. We got, I've got the, the huge book of hell here. And I just want to give some people some ideas of what we're talking about, what we're talking about here. Yeah. If you've not ever seen Life in Hell and you're a Simpsons fan, especially, it's shame on you. Um, yes. But um, secondly, go, go find a copy of whatever book. I mean, there's Love is Hell, Big Book of Hell, Huge Book of Hell, Work is Hell. There's a lot of smaller books. If you don't want to spring for the big book, you can get the smaller books that are more about specific topics. Yes. I so recommend uh, Akbar and Jeff's Guide to Life. Yes, that's an excellent one. Um, but anyway, they're, you know, they're, they're just really, especially in the early days when Matt wasn't as busy on, you know, working on TV shows, um, a lot of them are really dense. Um, in the later years, he didn't have as much time, so they would still be really funny and um, very clever, but a little more sparse in terms of the the dialogue and uh, the drawing. A lot of times it might just be like the same head talking in every panel or the same, you know, act learned. Or just a single panel, right? Like, uh, yeah, <laughs> like this is a good panel. example. Yeah. Uh, of some of the stuff he did. Now, just talk for a second, if you will, uh, just about his Matt's style, which on the very surface of it might seem crude yeah. to some. Talk about how much artistic drawing talent you, as a art school trained artist, what, what would you? What, what do you say when you look at a Matt Grading drawing from this period? Well, Matt Matt was always the first person to admit that he was foremost a writer and the way life in hell started was he moved to los angeles to become a writer in 
the entertainment industry. So he wanted to write TV shows or write movies. And the comic strip came about as a way of he would send letters to his friends and family back home. And he called it Life in Hell because life in Los Angeles for a young struggling writer was sometimes very hellish. He didn't have a lot of money. He had to work jobs that he didn't uh, enjoy in order to make ends meet, pay for rent. Um, and so that's why he called it life in hell. It was really life in Los Angeles. And, sure, and you could see the Simpsons roots even there as just as far as look like that is Marge's face at oh, the yeah. center of it. Right. Oh yeah, totally. Um, I mean, his, his style, I think came about, um, he told me once that he used to, as a kid, try to draw superheroes and they always came out looking like a guy in a, in like span in like a spandex suit stuffed with potatoes. <laughs> um, so he was he was always kind of a frustrated comic artist, but he sort of hit on this style that was um, easy. It didn't really require um, having to focus on anatomy a lot. Um, but you know, he was looking at a lot of newspaper cartoonists who were doing the same thing. Um, especially in, you know, people who were doing comic strips from the, from the fifties on where this minimalist style became popular. Like if you remember uh, just out of necessity, right? Just for, I mean, the, the size of the daily comic strips at some point. Yeah. I mean, uh, it sort of like the, the comics, the new comics that came about that were about humor and not adventure. Like you had adventure strips, um, Terry and the Pirates, and things that were very yeah, illustrious. yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you had strips that were just about humor. And I think the humor cartoonists in the early days, you had people like LZ Seeger doing Popeye, um, where you know this was a really very well drawn strip. He was a great draftsman, excellent perspective, um, not a lot of realistic anatomy, but cartoon anatomy that was very pretty precise yeah um, reminds me of maybe 50s, of a sorry go ahead sorry i was just gonna say by the 50s you had people like mel lazarus doing miss peach and he was influenced by the upa um, animation style that became popular in the late 40s um which was inspired by fine art what was going on in fine art at the time with picasso and you sure. know, artists like that, expressionists and impressionists. But artists. it was a perfect commercial style as well because it was cheaper to produce than 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 earlier traditional animation was, I think, too. Yes. And and I think the people who were doing that both in in cartoons and in comic strips realized you could do really funny drawings that didn't have to be that well drawn. Yeah. Because it was really about the writing. And and if the I, and if the drawing was funny and weird and it amplified the writing, so much the better. If I were going to pick one cartoonist from that time that I would say really reminds me of Granting, I, I maybe say Bush Miller mm -hmm. and and Nancy. It just remind just the 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 very iconic, you know, uh, completely unrealistic sort of flat design and character silhouettes and stuff. I feel like there's a connection there. Yeah, there's definitely a connection to Nancy and uh, Fritzy Ritz. Um, but also, if you, like, if you look at, go, go to that page you were just on, and if you look yeah. at um, Binky's arm, you know, that's just a callback to the typical rubber hose animation of the late 20s and early 30s with Mickey Mouse and um, Betty Boop. And, you know, the all the, all the cartoons back then, Characters didn't really have elbow joints. They just had these kind of rubber hose sort of arms yeah, and legs. And so he was really just calling back to that. Um, but, you know, I mean, if you look at this, you can tell he knew how to do perspective. Um, Composition, perspective, emotions. Right. It's all there. Yeah. And he also came up with one of the, one of the rules of the Simpsons, which is this day. Um, but it was kind of early on was don't 
have the characters cross-eyed. Like if Homer gets hit in the head, you know, a cartoon character from previous years, the reaction, which, you know, kind of was mimicking um, movie comics, like silent movie comics, the reaction is the eyes cross, the pupils go to the center. And that was funny, but Matt said, Matt realized in doing Life and Hell that if you separated the pupils and instead of going in towards each other, they went out away from each other, you got this kind of spaced out wide look. And it worked, it worked for a lot of emotions. It worked for, you know, dismay and disbelief and misunderstanding, um, as well as character gets hit in the head, you know, they're, they get this wall-eyed look. This isn't uh, quite it, but it's a, there's a slight, there's a little bit. Yeah, of there's that. a little bit of wall-eyed there. Um, but it, it, it suggests this sort of disconnection from the brain, like a little temporary disconnect. Um, yeah, so these are very thoughtful design choices put in by Matt Grant. That's what I'm trying to get at is that like cartooning skill is such a tough thing to quantify because it's not the best renderer that makes the best cartoonist necessarily. I mean, there is that confluence occasionally where you get both of those things together and get amazing stuff like whatever, Jeff Darrow or somebody like that. Right. But I'm a really big fan of just the simple design aesthetic that allows you to draw completely pull focus, if you will, to wherever you want on the page. They're all mm -hmm. sort of treated equally, but you can use line weights and, and, and whatever to draw attention. I, I yeah, really, 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 really think he's a skilled, under, uh, undervalued as a skilled cartoonist, certainly as a designer. Yeah, I think, I think he focused on the things that he realized were important to communicate whatever idea it was that he had um, and, and to do it as, you know, in the, in the best graphic way possible. Um, and the, and the things that he didn't really have to worry about, he didn't focus on yeah. and nobody, nobody missed it. You know, nobody missed, you know, nobody demanded that life and hell be drawn better. Yeah. You know? Well, it I was, think he could pull it off where, I don't know if you compare this to, let's just say, Dilbert. Okay. Yeah. Line quality and whatever might be similar, but I mean, it's just a whole different level of design chops and a approach to, to the comic that I. Yeah, I definitely. Really and, and Matt, Matt was a really excellent art director um, because of all the things that you've just mentioned. He, yes. You know, he was very involved in the comics and he would, you know, you would talk about line waves and, you know, placement of elements and all that stuff. And he knew it, he knew it backwards and forward. Okay. Which brings me right to a, one of my key, one of my first questions here. A lot of these covers say Matt Groening. Yes. And some of them, do, some of them have multiple credits. This one, I think credits you and no, no, Matt Groening and, and, and some other artists, which leads me to believe that, I mean, did he draw this comp pencil ink finish this or what's no. the story <laughs> no he didn't he didn't have time to do all that i mean i didn't think so especially laying, after, laying them out or is this just more of a like matt graining's simpsons kind of a thing yeah it's a it's a legal requirement that when he made his deal with fox um i don't know how many people know this i mean it's it's something i've mentioned in several interviews and i think matt's mentioned it as well but James Brooks, who's the producer of The Simpsons with Tracy Films, his company, originally wanted Life in Hell to be the little bumper cartoons for the Tracy Ullman show. Yeah. And Matt found out before going into this meeting with Fox where he was going to cement this deal, he was basically going in to pitch the idea of Life in Hell as, a, as an animated cartoon series. Um, he found out that if he made the deal, Fox would own Life in Hell. And he probably had a moment of panic because, I mean, he'd been working with these characters for a number of years at this point and didn't want to sell those characters, you know, just sell them to another company or to another entity. So he pivoted and came up with The Simpsons 
in a matter of minutes and he sketched out the family and he went into this meeting and he he said i know you're here to hear me pitch life in hell as an animated series but um or an animated series of little shorts but uh i've got something even better and he basically used his skills as a salesman to say you know this is going to appeal to a wider audience because it's it's a family of human characters. It's not little rabbits and and these twins that we don't know, you know, if they're brothers or lovers or what they are. Um, <laughs> you know, it, Life in Hell is very underground, and this is going to be more mainstream. And they said, well, but we like the, the humor of Life in Hell. And he said, oh, it's going to have the same subversive humor. All that's going to be there. It's just the characters are going to be a family. And we could do jokes about family situations. And they bought it. They said, okay, great. And when his lawyer made the deal, because she didn't want to see him, because you know, he was basically selling the Simpsons to Fox. They they own the Simpsons. He doesn't own it. Um, she didn't want them to be able to disassociate Matt with his own characters. So part of his deal demands that every time you see the Simpsons in print, whether it's on toy packaging or a t-shirt ah. or a book or whatever, it has to have Matt Groening's signature on it. Well, um, which at the time he was probably thinking like, you know, Simpsons maybe will be around for a few years, but you know, I'm going to have to get back to the grind maybe at some point or, you know, yeah, I'm nobody, sure he couldn't foresee four decades of. No, and nobody did. You know, yeah. everybody, everybody was taken by surprise. I think when it went beyond two seasons, I think two, they thought was probably the max. That oh man. I remember it was, like, that was the first prime time animated cartoon since the Flintstones, as I, mm -hmm. as I recall. And it wasn't the first one because uh, Hanna-Barbera did some in the seventies, but oh, it okay. was the first, first, you know, successful first, one. first really successful one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so how, how do you become involved then with the, the comic version? So The Simpsons hits in, what, 89 and right. is a overnight success. Uh, it's uh, it, But it's not without controversy. It causes a moral panic, if you can believe that. Like, looking back at the early Simpsons episodes and how quaint they are compared to what came even just a couple of years later. And the wholesomeness of The Simpsons overall, like that being baked in, that while subversion was important, I think it was maybe James L. Brooks that mandated that there sort of be a, like a heart and a soul to it. I, I I don't know how that worked out, but certainly that synthesis created something like uh, amazing and unequaled. Where, where people come along yeah. and the, you get the clones like the family guys or whatever, they, they miss out on that whole um you know actual like emotional resonance of the characters yeah i think for a lot of shows that came after they focus more on the jokes and the subversive humor um or you know just being gross um and getting laughs that way but yeah the simpsons i don't you know i think it was knowing matt's personality i think he had a lot to do with putting the heart in yeah. But um, probably also Sam Simon and James Brooks, yeah, you know, the yeah, three of them yeah. working together with the writers that they had to hire once they started doing a half hour show. And um, and yeah, it was really it was really something special because there was because it was you'd never seen anything like it on television before. Parents did freak out a little bit. <laughs> Come um, to twenty twenty. One, I'm sorry these are so beat up, but my five-year-old daughter just <laughs> loves them. She could, she, we watch The Simpsons together, and she does the voices, and she loves the characters oh, and the humor. It's um, really a bonding intergenerational thing for me. Yeah, that's, well, I'm I'm glad it came to that. You know, it wasn't that way so much in the early days, but no, yeah, not at um, all. Sometimes you had to sneak views, like when your parents were out of the house. Um, you know, if you could find it just right where your parents were out of the house and The Simpsons was on, or you had managed to tape it somehow. Um, but getting back to your question about the comic. Yeah. So another thing that Matt Groening's attorney did 
when she made his deal with Fox was she got them to give him the publishing rights, uh, which they've never done since that. So you know, you know how the you know George Lucas got the merchandise rights to Star Wars right. from yeah. Fox. Well, they realized that was a mistake, and they've never given anyone else merchandise rights on a film. In the, and in the same way, they they didn't think The Simpsons would be anything because it was just these little bumpers on the Tracy Ullman show. And Matt's attorney said, "Look, he's a cartoonist. He might want to do a comic strip or you know a comic book based on this." And they who said, knew? Oh. So they gave them the publishing rights. Amazing. So, so once The Simpsons became a huge overnight sensation, suddenly all of there were all these um, opportunities for merchandise. There were all these licensees pounding on the door of Fox saying, we want to do T-shirts and we want to do action figures and we want to do bedspreads and whatever. They also wanted to do books and comic books. And every time that happened, somebody at Fox had to say, well, we don't have the rights, you have to go talk to Matt Crane because he has Thank all the God. publishing rights. Thank God. When I think of the horrible licensed Simpsons comics that we could have had, mm -hmm. I go, thank God. God bless Graining, Morrison, <laughs> and now the lawyer. I'm going to say thank goodness for the lawyer. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was very savvy. And uh, so, so before doing the comics, we were doing... Um, I was recruited to do merchandise art in 1990, like almost at the very beginning. I think the, I think the half hour show had been on the air like a month when I was recruited by the person I mentioned previously, Millie Smythe, who Matt had now made his personal art director and his liaison between him and Fox licensing. So anytime that there was a, um, you know, a toy to be made or a t-shirt to be designed, she was the person Matt had put in place to do approvals so that things didn't just go off the rails and, you know, you have this really great TV show and the merchandise is crap. You know, it was like a quality control measure. So yeah, something like a, like a Charles Schultz, had to put the hammer down at one point on mm -hmm. licensing. And I think Jim Davis is the same kind of thing. Like yes. it must be on model and must be improved by pause Inc or who, whomever. Right. Yeah. And, um, there's a really great, uh, Facebook page called, uh, off model and loving it. Uh huh. Where people just post images of products and things, you know, some of them are bootlegs, but some of them are officially licensed products that have these drawings of characters that either look nothing like the character that they're representing or they, you know, have issues or whatever. But um, that's because I love they love the Simpsons have... bootleg t-shirts, the off-model Rasta oh, art and all those. Yeah. And Matt Groening used to collect, I don't know if he still does, but he used to collect all the bootleg stuff. He loves that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, anyway, um, I was recruited to draw merchandise art and there, yeah, there's, uh, one of the comic book guys, least favorite comic books. <laughs> <laughs> Bongo. Yep. Yeah, there it is. Love it. Love um, it. but anyway, um, uh, sorry yeah. to distract you there. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. That's what you thought. <clears throat> we started doing, um, we started doing books first, uh, Simpsons books and calendars. So I was. Oh, yeah. Those like Simpsons Guide to Life or whatever, those kind right. of things, which were always extremely high quality. Like, yeah, you're used to those things being so crappy with just maybe some screenshots, not original on model art in new funny situations and stuff like that. Right. Really and that's terrific. That's. That's the Mac Graining X Factor. That's, you know, I mean, he was really involved in those. And, you know, not drawing them and not necessarily writing them, although he did contribute in the early days to some of the writing. But um, he was overseeing everything and he had people in place that he trusted. So even if 
even if something went out that he didn't have time to officially approve, he knew it was going to be great because of the people that he had put in place to oversee it. So because I'd been already recruited to do the merchandise art and some of the same people like Millie and Steve and Cindy Vance were, were brought in to work on these books. Um, they brought me in to do a lot of the artwork and eventually a lot of the writing. So, yeah, so we did like the Simpsons uncensored family album. Uh, you mentioned Bart's guide to life. Um, uh, Are those still in print by the way? I think so. Um, I, I remember we gave them a little bit of a facelift. Um, after Bongo was kind of established, all the book publishing sort of got folded into Bongo. So we would actually work with Harper Collins or, or whatever um, publishing, you know, non-Bongo publishing arm was was handling the calendars or, or the bookshelf books or whatever. So we would work with them uh, provide artwork, provide design and art direction. Um, but the, the the comic books came out of a magazine that we were doing that was called Simpsons Illustrated. Yeah, yeah. And it was a, a quarterly, I think it was a quarterly magazine. Yeah. It was a Simpsons fan magazine. So it was full of articles and, you know, games and puzzles and just fun stuff, mainly for kids. Um, but I think adult Simpsons fans got into it as well. And the well, first let me just say that when you bring that up, you guys walk the line so well of making true all ages comics. These were not like little Lotta or something or, or whatever, you know, they were, you could, I still read them to my kids and just love them so much. The attention to detail of show continuity, mm -hmm. but not just, stealing catchphrases and putting you know it, it, it it's the writing is so cohesive and and close to the show that that always blew me away the the writing on top of the ultra solid cartooning and design well we always thank you that um that makes me happy to hear that because that was sort of job one for me you um, succeeded I, thank you um Woo we i always felt like the comic books and the books were an extension of the show. Um, and I also, even though the show hasn't ended, it's you know still going strong. My, my idea was always that much like Disney comics continued doing Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck adventures long after they stopped doing animated shorts, I always imagined that we would still be doing comics long after the show was canceled. Yeah. And so yeah. we would we would be the only source for new Simpsons stories, and I wanted those stories to be authentic and feel like an episode. Like when you read a Simpsons comic, I wanted I wanted you to feel like you were watching the show. And the best compliments I ever got was like people would come up to me at a convention or whatever, and they would start talking to me about an episode of the show, and I would realize they were talking about a comic book story we did. And uh, so they were getting them confused in their mind. They were so close that they didn't remember that what they were talking about was a comic they read and not an animated episode they had seen. Um, so that was, that was the goal, to do that. Well, you succeeded, I'm going to say that for sure. Um, but what I want to say is that the the work betrays like it's not just about the simpsons your love of comics and comics history oh man really really shines through uh, in this can you just talk about that a little bit about your own fandom and how that informed what sure. we saw in like radioactive man and and some of the other stuff well it kind of started with radioactive man because radioactive man existed on the show but he wasn't he wasn't fleshed out you know, he didn't have a really a supporting cast other than Fall Out Boy. I think there were a few villains that were sort of hinted at. But when we decided to start Bongo, we we wanted to do Radioactive Man because that was a no brainer, and just do a Radioactive Man series or at least a mini series. Um, but we had to come up with a cast, and uh, we had to come up with more villains. So we actually created his secret identity. 
and his love interest Gloria Grand and all the all the um, a lot of the stuff that they eventually used on the show. I mean, they started actually taking our designs for Radioactive Man and making the character on the show look more like he looked in our comics. Um, because but, it, but it's not a facile imitation of what Joe Blow thinks a superhero comic is. These were hyper specific, yeah. uh, different eras of comics. Just that one, and then like even this, mwah, Bill. This is the kind of thing only a comics fan is going to get and love. Right. So, so the way this came about is we did a six issue series, and Steve Vance was for the most part, writing everything. I wrote one issue with Steve, but mostly he scripted everything and and I did the artwork. And the idea was we'll launch Radioactive Man number one as if it's a comic from 1952, right around the time when they were doing atomic bomb testing in the desert because they had already shown on the show that his origin was sort of like the Incredible Hulk where he was caught in a, a nuclear blast out in the desert and he gets these powers. So, so we, we riffed on that and we said, let's make his first issue 1952. But in this six issue series, let's explore the history of comics from 1952 up through the present day, which at the time was 1994 with image comics and image comics was the big thing. So the second yeah. issue was uh, Fantastic Four, uh, early Marvel pastiche, and then the third. I don't issue have was... that one, but I have where you guys did it again in the comic oh. book guy book. Yeah, yeah, I've gone to the well twice now on that on that Fantastic Four number one cover. How can you not? Other classic Marvels, just showing your fandomness here. Oh I yeah, think. yeah. I my favorite one though is. When you get into imitating the price guide, that's where, <laughs> mwah, Bill. Well, I owned a comic book store when this came out, and it was like, you guys just are in my head somehow. Amazing stuff. So here's the thing. Be because of doing this Radioactive Man series where we got to play with paying tribute to comics that we loved growing up throughout you know, the 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, we also started doing that in Simpsons comics because we realized even though we were appealing to Simpsons fans, the, the people who are reading our comics are also comic fans. There are people that go into comic shops and buy Batman and X-Men and Bone and, you know, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. or whatever. Wow. Whereas... Again. <laughs> that's one of my... That one was one of my favorites. I'm a big Steranko fan, so I, you probably noticed I've I've swiped from Steranko, you know, at least a dozen times on some. Who of has it? Days. How can you not? <laughs> um, but that, actually, the um, the story, the, the interior story of this one, which is a backup story, um, I drew it, but Steve Vance laid it out, and he he does like a beautiful Nick Fury Steranko. Um, homage with the silent page like the very famous silent page with the gun going into the holster where he's he's making out with uh, the female shield agent in his bachelor pad kind of uh -huh. thing um anyway um we the point i'm making is we we realized that whereas the show could do a comic joke occasionally their audience was much wider. They had a mainstream audience that didn't necessarily get comic references. Yeah. So they couldn't do it as much. Or if they did it, it had to be a joke about Action Comics number one. Or, you know, whatever Spider-Man thing was in the news now. It couldn't be the, you know, the micro yeah. um, fan stuff that only a, a real comic fan would know about. But we could you can't make that. Jimmy Olsen references, or maybe you could do that, but you can't make Rick Jones references or whatever, right. you know? But but we could, because we yeah. knew that our readers and our fans got that. We knew that they would get those jokes. Um, and so because I'm such a huge comics fan and um, a fan of many genres and many eras, 
Um, I just started, you know, mining whatever I, I could. And Matt encouraged it. Matt, I remember we had the, uh, you probably have this on your massive shelf of books back there, the, the Gerber guide that has all the uh, No, covers. I don't. I don't have those. Okay. Well, for anybody that doesn't know what those are, they're- I know what um, they are. Yeah. The I photo think, guides, right? Yeah, they're guides. Do I have them here? Yeah, I got one right here. Sometimes this is the only way, if you want to actually look at some of these comics, that you're ever going to get a detailed look at the stuff they put in there. Yeah, so here's the photo journal. Yeah, let me pull you up. Yeah. There were show two that again, volumes. please. Yeah. What's that? So I got you full screen now. Go ahead and show that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So here's the cover yeah. of uh, one of the volumes. There were two volumes that covered like Golden and Silver Age comics, and then there were two volumes that were just Marvel. And they had like every Marvel comic up to the date where the books were published. But these books are just full of A to Z um, comics that you, you know, Walt Disney comics yeah. and stories like everywhere. Yeah. So Matt, Matt used to encourage me. He'd say, hey, if you're ever strapped for an idea, just get out that Gerber photo journal guide and, you know, see if you can find some inspiration. So I used to do that all the time. Some people might call it swiping. Um, and I might be one of those people. But because we were doing satire and parody, even though I'm, I'm swiping an idea, maybe, I'm also paying tribute. Of course. It's also a nudge and a wink and a nod to um, a specific era or a specific artist. And it, and it plays into the kind of story that we're telling. Um, so with the, like with the comic book guy cover being um, an homage to Fantastic Four number one, um, I had this idea for this, the first issue of this book to actually do variant covers. Um, and we did, I think we did four, four or five variant covers, <laughs> but but Matt was always big on not taking advantage of the fans. Like, like don't make the fans have to buy multiple issues, you know, to get everything you're putting out. So um, I thought, what if we did variant covers, but we contained them all within the one book? So we actually printed on cover stock. So like if you get comic book guy number one and you open it up, the first thing you're going to see is another variant cover. Oh, that's awesome. And then, and it's not just printed on newsprint, it's on cover stock. And then you turn the page and it's another one and you turn the page and it's yet another one. So we were able to make a statement about comic book guy by, by doing homages to these cl classic covers. Um, and then got into telling the story of his, his death and resurrection. Awesome. Well, these were, I mean, all the references on point so much. It just showed that whoever was behind Bongo Comics just loved comics. You know, it was, it's so clear. And, and, and that's what allows, I think, any adult, but especially a comics loving adult, to just really enjoy The Simpsons just as a pure reading experience, not as like a retro thing necessarily, but just as a pure fun to read comics that's a that's a big achievement yeah well thank you and that was um when we did the bart simpson book um the the first the initial idea for that one was just to do shorter stories like every issue of simpsons comics would have a big main story and then a very short backup story but we thought well let's just do one pagers and let's do five page stories and let's yeah. do comics more like the comics that we read as kids, but still keeping that Simpsons edge to it. So, and I love the, the back cover parodies too. Such yeah, the, great. And yeah, we did those as flip covers originally, so they would actually be like you had to flip the book over. Um, so it's like a way of giving Barney his own cover and giving yeah, it's great. Apu and Mo. So giving them their, their own title in a way with, without actually launching a new first issue. Yeah. Um, although I think that little Homer one, yeah, that little Homer one is an actual first issue. And the oh, rap, really? 
Oh, yeah, those cool. those those are actual. We did um, a series called One Shot Wonders. So we did Ralph Wiggum number one, Little Homer. Oh, great, Mr. Burns. I just remember so Good many figure. great cover parodies. They're the X Men Days of Future Past cover parody I had on my phone just for years. It's so they're so perfect in so many ways. Um, okay, but so Simpsons, obviously, everybody knows the Simpsons. Humongous hit, cash cow. Bongo is financially solid. I'm sure you're selling. I'm just gonna guess that you sold more into, and maybe you don't even know this, but I'd be interested in knowing more to the direct market or more to in graphic novels to the book trade. I think more more to the book trade. Um, you know, we did we did okay in the direct market domestically, but where we really made a lot of money is uh, licensing the books to foreign publishers. Ah, very so much like one, Disney, right? All over the world. Right. So at one time, for, for many, many years, we were the number two comic in Germany. Oh, whoa. And number one was Mickey Mouse. And Mickey you Mouse know, that makes, yeah. sold like, you know, in the million. Um, so we were a distant second, but we were still ahead of Batman, Spider-Man, X-Men, Superman, Which everything. makes perfect sense when you consider the European comics tradition and asterisks, Tintin, et cetera. Simpsons right. fits really well into that mold. Yeah. Um, well, speaking and the UK, of... The UK, we did really well. Um, but we were everywhere. I mean, at one point, we had comics in um, Spain, Portugal, uh, Mexico, South America. Um, okay, speaking of Mexico... Japan, that allowed you guys to do some really cool work um, with none other than, like, pro I would say the most legendary living cartoonist today is, uh, to me, is yeah. Sergio Aragones. Yeah, who's El Maestro. Better than, who's better than Sergio? No one. <laughs> um, he was such a joy uh, to work with. Yeah. Um, Sergio and I were already friends when I asked him to do an issue of Trios of Horror. So... Um, I invited him, like Treehouse of Horror, we could do a whole episode on that. Oh, yeah. Um, but Treehouse was the book where we invited artists and writers that we at Bongo admired and were fans of to come and sort of play with our toys and do a Simpsons story. So one day I invited Sergio to do a story. I knew he was a huge Simpsons fan already. Yeah, yeah. So he immediately said yes. Did a, a, an awesome story about the um, Day of the Dead celebration in Mexico, and um, and then for so many travel that, comics that he did, right? As the world traveler that he is, he did a lot of travel stuff in this book, as I remember. Well, in in his uh, funnies book that came later, he always did an autobiographic story in every yeah, issue. Book, right? Yeah, that's that's uh, Sergio Aragon's funnies number one. Um. But the, the uh, Trials of Horror story, you know, was years before that. But then something kind of fortunate happened. Um, unfortunate in many ways, but fortunate for me at Bongo and fortunate for Sergio um, in, in a way, which was that MAD in 2008, MAD magazine decreased, they, uh, they kind of decreased their publishing output from I think at the time it was it was either monthly or eight times a year I believe down to quarterly yeah and so that took a big bite out of Sergio's income and I heard this news I remember hearing it on the news driving into work so as soon as I got to the office I called Sergio and for years we've been talking about him doing something else for Bongo but he never seemed to have the time to do it. So I called him up and I was very consoling. And I said, oh, Sergio, I heard the news about MAD. You know, I'm really sorry. That's terrible. Um, I know that's going to really affect your income. By the way, <laughs> now, that you, now that you've got a little more time on your hands, how now about you're desperate for money? <laughs> <laughs> how about doing that thing we talked about for years, which was you doing some regular you know, not just in the Halloween issue, some regular Simpson stories. 
So we had we had launched the Bart Simpson title, and I, this is perfect because he can do. If he has time to do a one pager, great. If he's got time to do ten pages, fantastic. Um, so he started being a reg regular contributor to the Bart Simpson title. Um, he wrote also a, a wrote and drew also a few regular Simpsons issues. Um, Probably some of the most off model issues I've I, I would say out there. But who cares, right? When you have a master yes. doing his thing. And and by this time, when when we first started inviting artists outside of like the bongo bullpen to do Simpsons artwork, the, the first issue of Treehouse of Horror we had Jeff Smith, um, Mike Allred, and James Robinson, but they were only writing. Wow. Um, and I think Mike Allred inked his story, but he didn't draw it. I penciled it, and he inked it. Um, and that was because at the time we were thinking everything's got to look like the show. It's got to be on model. But Jeff Darrow um, did a pinup in an issue of Treehouse that was a little bit off model. Um, but as, as the editor, I was editor at, th at that point, And I was like, you know what, who cares? Because I think Jeff Darrow fans are going to want to see how he does. Of course. Simpsons. And it's only two pages. It was a two page pinup spread. And I thought, you know, if, if I get criticism or, if, you know, Matt's unhappy with it, it's only two pages. So I think I can weather that hit. Matt came down to my office after seeing that and he goes, this is fantastic. He says, let's do more of this. Let's let's let the artists on Trials of Horror do their own style. He says, the only thing is the characters still have to have the bulgy eyes and the overbites. But other than that, Let's let them do their own thing. So that's amazing because I think that philosophy bled over in recent years to the TV series where now they have different animators doing right. the couch gags and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Dope Which is, thing. as an artist, to, to put aside your ego that way and to say there's these other artists and let them draw my stuff in their way. I right. don't want to say it's... I, I want to say it's un, uh, unusual, um, and but so great to add a little freshness to something that we've been looking at for 40 years. Right. And, and, you know, Matt's uh, savvy enough to recognize that, but also very generous and he loves yeah. other artists and he loves, he loves cartooning and comics like I do. So it's like, let's see how it would be fun to see how Peter Bag does the Simpsons or, you know, whoever. So at that yes, point, it would be the floodgates were kind of open and I was able to get stories by Bernie Wrightson and Gene Colan and wow. Mark Schultz and Al Williamson. Yeah, the greats. And, and uh, the list goes on and on. It, it, there's actually a book coming out that Abrams is doing that collects the Trios of Horror stories. And I think a lot of people miss them. I think fans of, of mainstream comic artists are going to be blown away because these, these are Simpsons stories by they're heroes that they've probably mostly never seen. I'm adding that. I'm going to pick that one up for sure, Bill. That sounds great. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's going to be a big hit. Um, okay. Anyway, but, it was, um, yeah. So at this point, Sergio doing his style with the Simpsons. I mean, if you look at his drawings, they're very much his style, except that everybody's got overbites and the eyes are a little bit bulgier than yeah. he would normally do. Um, so that led to, he pitched me an idea one day and he said, do you think Bongo would be interested in me doing a book called Sergio Aragonis Funnies that is just um, me doing my own thing, not me working with Mark Evanier. Yes. Um, just, you know, just me doing my own stories and, and my own puzzle pages and game pages and whatever I feel like doing. And I said, well, I, I'm on board automatically. I'll pitch it to Matt. And Matt was a Matt still is a huge fan of Sergio. So Matt was like, Yeah, let's, you know, talk to the lawyers and, and uh get them to write up a contract. So they did. Um so we had a contract for a twelve issue series, which we did. Every issue has um an historic story, just Sergio's take on the Trojan horse. 
or um, something that's maybe not a famous historic thing, but something that he's really into and knows about and wants to share with his audience. Every issue has an autobiographic story. So there's a great story about the time uh, Sergio created a giant King Kong head out of paper mache as a present for Bill Gaines at MAD. Yeah. Um, and there's a, a great story about the mad trip to Mexico that they took one year where all the, you know, Bill Gaines would bring all the art writers um, on, a, on a trip. It was kind of like a bonding experience. Um, I, I, I interviewed Mark Evner here and I've, I'm reaching out currently to try and get a Sergio interview going because talk about the most interesting man in the world. This is who, <laughs> this is the most interesting man in the world. And I think... This is his best, this is the best comics I've ever read from Sergio because there's so much of him in them. Right? Yeah, the, they're very personal. Him writing it and bringing his stories and the things that he loves, his interests are so varied as a mm -hmm. fan, as a historical fan. He is just, he's the bee's knees. And then so. Um, yeah, he's I, well, I want to... We could talk about Sergio for the rest of this show, but let's talk about a couple of the other cartoonists that you guys published, not through Bongo Comics, but through Zongo Comics, and then we'll, we'll and then we'll talk about Roswell. Okay. Uh, and let's talk. So let's talk about um, Fleener, and let's talk about Jimbo. So Zongo came about because Matt, um, you know, has cartoonist friends who are more underground. Um, you know, they, they come from more of the sensibility that he came from with Life in Hell. Um, he's very good friends with Gary Panter, um, as well as Mary Fleener. And he wanted to do an imprint that would allow them to self-publish um, and maybe get their stuff seen by a wider audience. So, so that was the idea behind Zongo. I think, um, I think it may be didn't last as long as it should have probably just because it wasn't marketed well enough. And I agree one, with that. I think the one failing of Bongo is that we, we really didn't have a marketing department because with the Simpsons comics, we didn't need to. And with Futurama comics, I mean, we had yep. built in fans ready to take our money, uh, ready for us to take their money rather. And um, so it never seemed to be something that we needed to spend money on. So when Zongo came along, we put the comics out there, but we didn't have a marketing department to really push them and, and you know, make the people who would be likely to buy comics like these aware of them. Well, these are tough sales, even in a traditional comic shop, right? Like these were carried, both of these guys, both of these artists had stuff you know, that you could get in your better comic shops, but I would say conservatively 90% of the comic shops in America never carried anything by either of these guys, uh, yeah. folks. And that I just would have loved to have seen like really this succeed and bring in even more cartoonists. I think, you know, how about a Dave Cooper issue and how about a, yeah. uh, you know, Hernandez brothers. There's so many. And, and Matt was friends with and, uh, a fan of all those people you just mentioned and I'm many sure. more. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure he had a list, if not actually written out, but you know, in the back of his mind of people that he would like to have added to Zongo. But I think unfortunately the you know the sales just were not good enough to to keep it afloat. These are a tough sell. These are gonna be a tough sell. Those who like them can recognize the quality, but it's a it's a tough sell even to comic book people. This could yeah. be a tough sell. I think it would have been more of a, I don't know. We don't have head shop outlets for comics anymore. So like mm -hmm. that's where this stuff could have, right. some of it could have, could have shown. Yeah. Record store. Um, um, record store. Yeah. Um, even Roswell, my Roswell comic didn't sell well because, yeah. you know, it, the only other thing out there at the time that was like it was maybe Bone and a few other things. Um, because it was like an ongoing 
humor adventure sort of thing. And yeah, there just wasn't a lot like it at the time. It was, it was different enough from the Simpsons that it didn't really appeal to, it appealed to, I think some of our regular readers, but not a lot of them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, and without a marketing department to really push it and get it out there and get it in bookstores and, and say, Hey, let's do it a trade paperback and get that out there into Barnes and Noble, et cetera. Was this ever put into trade paperback form? The Not first well. three issues, uh, plus um, we, we actually launched it in the back pages of Simpsons comics for four issues. And so those four chapters plus the first three issues were collected. I see. And um, the, the cover that you're showing there, the German one with the, uh, movie marquee that is the biggest collection of the that that actually i think i think that's the complete collection i think it has all six issues plus the preview but it was only done in germany oh boo yeah that's the reason for those words that most of you just Underneath the yeah, we don't we don't like that at all. Okay, well, so Bongo successful. I mean, The Simpsons, hundreds of issues of The Simpsons were produced over many years. What happened? Why? Where did Bongo go? Um, I was already gone by the time Bongo folded, so I don't really know the details. Oh, I see. Um, my my guess is just that the the big, like I said, the biggest sales were the foreign sales. And if the show is not on the air in a certain market, then there's not really a publisher interested in doing the comics. Yeah. So once it went off the air in Germany, um, the comics weren't as popular. That shocks me that it went off the air in Germany. Yeah, I think it went off. It might be back, but um, a lot of times like licenses would expire in a, in a foreign country and then you'd see it you see actually the show disappear, but then it might come back because another um, broadcaster would pick it up, another studio. Um, I remember in the early days in Germany, it was it was kind of marketed as a kid show. So yeah. it was only on in the afternoon. It was like yeah, an after yeah. school show. And then it had been on the air, I think, a couple of years. And then another um network picked it up and they put it on in prime time pretty so, good kid show i would have loved that as a kid as a young german lad yeah uh, well, you know i think so, it's just, things are sporadic in different countries and you know if it's in the country that's not the original producer of the thing yeah um you know it's just making a deal for however long you can make the deal and then if yeah, the deal yeah. expires and they don't renew then it's gone and, and it's just sort of an ancillary thing, people. right? Like you license it to them. I assume they do the translations, et cetera, or? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk uh, about um, why you left Bongo. Well, I left, um, first of all, I left my, my job at Bongo as creative director, but stayed with Bongo for a couple of years um, just because I was, a little bit in a rut. Um, editing comics felt a little bit like grading test papers for me because it was it was a lot of script reading and making notes and. Um, it's know, not that fun to read a comic book script, right? Compared to reading a yeah, know, reading a comic. Um, it takes focus. It you know it takes you really have to pay attention and um, and you have to think about you know, is there a continuity error that I'm not thinking of, that I'm not picking up? So your mind is always focused on like problem solving, looking for problems and then solving them. And so, I don't know, it just got to be kind of wearying. And I knew that Matt was working on, he was or at least planning to do a new TV show beyond Futurama. And he had also talked to me about launching a new comic book company you know, that he wanted to do a company that maybe did humor comics, but also did superheroes that oh, did whoa. crime comics that did romance, it did all kinds of different genres. Yeah. 
And so I was aware of that. And I went to um, the powers that be and I said, you know, I, I'd really like to start working with Matt on some of these other things. So I'm thinking about maybe stepping down as creative director to, to kind of jumpstart these other things that I know Matt is interested in doing. So that was agreed upon, but because Matt was not quite there yet in terms of being ready to start working on these ideas, he was still kind of processing. Um, he had also gotten remarried and um, started having kids again. So now all of a sudden he's got babies to get home to at night. So he's not staying late, you know, for after hours meetings. Um, uh, there wasn't a lot for me to do in the area of working on the new company and the new TV show. So that was still like maybe a year in the future, but Bongo wanted to do, wanted to develop some comic reader apps for uh, iPads, iPhones, Android, et cetera. So I started doing that. So I did that for a couple of years and, and helped develop a uh, Simpsons comic reader app and a Futurama app. How cool. And by the time I got finished with those, disenchantment was now something Matt was ready to start working on. So I started, um, still employed by Bongo, I started working on um, disenchantment, doing character designs, just preliminary exploratory stuff. How might this Elfo character look? Um, how might Bean look? You know, just come up with different ways that these characters might appear. So I did that for a while, but then once um, we had final designs and Matt pitched the show to Netflix and Netflix bought it, I got the notice that suddenly Matt was no longer go going to be paying my salary because now I'm going to be employed by Netflix. Oh. And the problem with that was that Netflix didn't have a big budget for the show and so my pay was going to be cut by about 30 percent so uh, I, no indeed so i had to start thinking you know can i afford to stay in this job um i can't go back to my bongo job because now nathan kane's doing what i was doing i'm not gonna screw a friend out of a job i you know, trying to get back so i thought well maybe i can I can still pay my bills, you know, work on the show, but then start doing some freelance stuff on the side. Well, my Netflix contract said that I couldn't do that. It said that I was exclusive. So I asked them, can I, can I do freelance work that doesn't compete with the work I'm doing on the show? So they rewrote my agreement and said, you know, I can do comic book work. I can I can work on anything that's not in competition with the Netflix show. So that was like, okay, fine. Problem solved. And I started <gasps> putting viewers out. <laughs> Thank you, Homer. And one of the first things I did was I reached out to Dan DiDio at DC Comics. We've interviewed him here on this show. Oh, cool. Dan Dan's a wonderful guy. He was a great boss. Great guy. Yeah, great guy. And he um he wanted to meet with me right away because I, I I told him I was interested in freelance or if he possibly had something that was more full-time. I wouldn't know what that would be, but I'd be interested in hearing about that. So he contacted me, said, let's have lunch. And then he started telling me about his problem with Mad Magazine, which was that when DC moved from New York to California to Burbank, the guys at Mad Magazine kind of dug in their heels and they said, we don't want to move because we're a New York magazine. We're New York people and Mad should be done here. Um, you know, they went back and forth for a while, but finally DC or probably more like Warner Brothers said, all right, we'll put them up in some office space in New York for the time being. They can keep doing the magazine. But in the meantime, you have to start looking for somebody to take over who's local to Los Angeles. Um, so Dan had been kind of quietly looking for somebody, uh, not really putting it out there, but 
you know, kind of keeping his ears open. So when he got the message from me saying that I was available, um, he said, you know, a light bulb just kind of went on and he's, he thought, he, I mean, he told me, he said, I thought you were sort of joined at the hip with Matt Craning. I never really thought about you because I just thought you were always going to be doing the Simpsons and Futurama, et cetera. Um, but he said, once I realized you were a free agent, then I thought you would be the perfect person to take over Matt. So that is a long way of answering the question of how I ended up leaving Bongo. It wasn't like, it wasn't just like a, one day I'm through. It was sort of like a gradual, you know, moving away from the stuff I was doing at Bongo, doing other things, working on Matt's new show, and then finally going to Mad Magazine. So when I heard about this, you making this move, I was like, I could not think of a person more perfectly suited, like just based on what you had proven in The Simpsons. I mean, The Simpsons is a spiritual successor to the subversiveness of Mad Magazine. There is no Simpsons comedy totally. without what is in Mad Magazine. Some people felt that was sort of lacking in maybe in more recent years. It could have been a little more subversive. Although I did like the hiring of a lot of underground cartoonists to work at Mad, and I mm -hmm. felt like the edge, it still had an edge, but it needed a modernization. And, and when I see the last issue of Mad here, yeah, and then the first new one, I think about the subtleties of what made it, how you modernized it. Like I look at the curly cues on the M or on the logo compared mm -hmm. to the more streamlined logo, things like, can you talk a little bit about what other kind of decisions, design decisions or editorial decisions you might've made when going from this to this? Well, with the logo, we, we were, um, calling back to Harvey Kurtzman's original Mad logo. Yeah. And so we kind of redesigned that a little bit, but I think any Mad fan looking at that recognizes the source of that. So my my main idea was, and I was given, the, the task I was given was basically, we have this huge subscriber base for Mad. And most of Mad's sales were actually from subscription. Um, you know, the, the three buckets were subscriptions, um, newsstand sales, and direct market. And direct market was kind of negligible. Newsstand was okay, but it was shrinking because all magazine sales are shrinking sure. on the newsstand. Sure. But the, the subscription was still really healthy because you have all these hardcore mad fans who, even if they don't read the magazine anymore, they're buying it for their kids. Or they have a complete run and they don't want to yeah. ruin that. And momentum. Wanted, yeah. So there's this huge base and they said, we don't want to lose any subscribers, but we want you to overhaul the magazine to bring in uh, female readers and 20 something readers and other ethnicities that aren't, you know, basically Mad's readership was, you know, 11 to 16 year old white males and 40 to 65 year old white man. I, I really did love the choice to go with the old logo here because I didn't even, I mean, I did recognize it as the old one. Now that you say it, of course it is, but it has such a modern feel to it. I don't know mm -hmm. if you changed the treatment at all of it, but yeah, it, we, it we, really, uh, yeah. we streamlined it and, um, you know, we, we kept as much of it as was necessary to make it recognizable as as having come from the harvey kurtzman but the harvey kurtzman one is kind of hand-drawn and yes. uh um you know this one is very uh deliberately um you know straight lines and even though things are off like if you look at the the width mm -hmm. of the yes. spoke and the m the one on yeah. the right is wider than the one on yes. the left. yeah and the same with the a um, and the, the, uh, triangle in the center, you would expect it to follow the strokes of the two sides of the A, but it goes beyond it. So it like yeah. cuts into the stroke. So there's little weird things that, that make it kind of off. I but, love yeah. that kind of detail, like that you're conscious of those kind of details. You know what I mean? That those, yeah. 
thought about. I think the old logo, or not the this logo, the 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 previous one with the curlies, uh, is iconic unto itself. I would think that's a lot of people remember that because that's what it was from the seventies, probably. Sure. Or more I mean, most of Mad's history has been that that logo, yeah. So, but, but you know, the pull back to... from an older one and modernize it. Really great tribute to go like this is the same Mad, but a little bit right. Different. And that was that was kind of the problem to solve was don't lose any hardcore Mad fans, but bring in all these people who may have never even heard of Mad. And you know how do you do that without alienating the people who are the the existing fan base? Yeah. Yeah, so one of the things thing. was the logo. Um, another thing was bringing back some of the the classic Mad things that have gone by the way over the years. You know, we brought back the lighter side. Um, Dave Berg still around, or were they? No, they were re we couldn't resurrect Dave Berg, but <laughs> you know, we found um, John Adams, oh, who has a very different style, but somehow it was suited to yeah. and. Um, uh, what else did we, we brought, we brought back a number of things, but we also find found ways of taking existing things that, um, that were essential to mad and, and kind of changing them up a little bit. Like, for example, um, I felt, I kind of sat down and examined mad and I, and I thought, okay, if, if we have to change the magazine, what are the things that if we change this one thing, people will flip out. You know the existing fans will flip out, and I I decided on my my list was Alfred has to you know we still have to have Alfred. Um, fold we have have in spy, spy versus spy. Yeah, fold in marginals. Whatever Sergio does, including the marginals, you know. But Sergio's mad. Look at whatever. Um, and and a movie or TV satire, but. Yeah. I thought, like, for the first issue, I thought, well, how can we do a movie satire but do it in a little bit different way that also is kind of a fan pleaser, like an existing fan pleaser? And I was I was watching at the time I was watching Riverdale. And Riverdale's a hot show. And I thought, well, let's do a satire of Riverdale. But the thing I noticed about Riverdale is they they changed the Archie characters to the point where you know, there's murder and there's, you know, sex and violence and gangs and all this stuff. And I thought about the uh, Will Elder, Harvey Kurtzman, uh, Starchy. Star yeah. And how they're portrayed as juvenile delinquents. Yes. But they're, kind of, but they're kind of tame compared to Riverdale. So I thought, what if the, what if the Starchy characters like somehow time travel to the future and they see Riverdale and they're like, you guys are way worse than we ever were. <laughs> um, so with that kind of germ of idea, I, I pitched it to Ian Boothby and uh, I talked to Tom Richmond about drawing it. Tom did a dead perfect Will Elder. So he drew the whole thing. He drew the, the Riverdale in his you know usual style, but then the sequence that's, um, you know, the, the starchy sequence, it's incredible. And the fans loved it. They were like, you're doing something a little different, but you're you're uh, paying homage to the stuff that we love and that we grew up with and that we still love. And it got a great reaction. So we just kept kind of doing more of that. And um, and, uh, you know, that that seemed to work because our subscription numbers started going up. Oh, great. That's great yeah. to hear. That is awesome. Yeah. So that was a. That, that cover there, um, issue three, um, that one got a little bit of criticism from a couple of fans. Only because we messed with Alfred's attitude on this one. So if you notice, like, Alfred, mm -hmm. Alfred is always easygoing. Yes. Um, if you ever see his expression change, it's more worry or dismay. Yeah. It's not, it's not really mischief or evil. Yeah, yeah. And we gave Alfred a little bit of an evil look with his eyebrows on this one. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we always paid attention to 
what fans were saying. And there was a little bit of criticism on that, that it was kind of out of character for Alfred to be wanting to whack Bill Cosby in the head. With, I think it's a but, great move. I think it's a great character move. And that's what the Alfred E. Newman character need is maybe in our modern era is a, a little more edge. Well, that's what we felt. We, we yeah. felt, you know, that we could, you know, we were trying to see how far we could push him, you know, see totally. if there's anything we could do with his character that might be, um, you know, still Alfred, but modernized a little bit. Okay. So the thing with, push, the, yeah. with the first issue with the middle finger up the nose, uh huh. Um, that's that's really an homage to a classic Mad a cover classic. from the seventies, which just had nothing but a middle finger. Um, it said the number one F magazine. Right. Um, yeah, but, that's right. What a loving just tribute to the the history of Mad. I I, re, I I hadn't bought magazine Mad magazine in many years. I bought this one. Because a lot of it, and I'll tell you the truth, Bill, because I saw your name wasn't being attached to it. And I knew the quality of comics, because that's what Matt is, right? It's a comic. You can call it a magazine all you want. It's a comics magazine. And I knew that, one, the level of satire would be there, but the level of quality and attention to detail would also be there. And it was. Um, so tell us what's next for Bill Morrison. Um, well, I'm like I mentioned earlier, I'm uh, freelance, so I'm doing comics, illustration, uh, books, prints, all kinds of different things. I just uh, this book just came out, which I'll plug. Oh, yeah, let me pull you up. This is All You Nerd Is Love, a Yellow Submarine puzzle book. Oh, awesome. And this this came about because in 2018, I did a graphic novel adaptation of the Beatles Yellow Submarine film. So, so this book- Which I is, have not seen before, and I, want, I definitely want to check that out. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's like a full 90, I think it's 96 pages. Adaptation. You get backstory on the Blue Meanies? Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's really a straight adaptation of the film. Oh, okay. Um, so it's, it doesn't-, it doesn't um, go beyond what's in the film. It's, uh, I mean, I did have to write some gags because when you're doing any kind of adaptation, it's difficult to just adapt something straight. You know, things don't always translate directly. Sure. So some, something that works in film, for example, on a comic page, you need like maybe a little voiceover narration to transition from one thing to the next. So, um, you know, so I had to write uh, some material that's not in the film, but overall it's, it's very faithful. Um, this is, um, a series. It's, I think the third book in a series by, um, Eagle Moss, which has an imprint called hero collector. Mm -hmm. And it's basically, there's all these spreads in the book that are scenes from the film, but there are mistakes. There's continuity errors. There's things that didn't happen that aren't right. And uh, as a nerd, as a, as a Beatles yellow submarine nerd, um, the challenge is to, to see how many things you can spot that are wrong. And then you, you sort of grade yourself at the end of the book. They have, uh, you know, pages that just show you, you know, what you should have gotten right, what you miss, all that stuff. Um, so that was really fun. Um, I'm doing a, a comic for Ahoy Comics, um, which is, um, it's I think it's a one shot that Gail Simone wrote. And it's part of a series called Wrong Earth, which features a character called Dragonfly. Um, I shouldn't say too much about it other than um, I'm just... You know, Gail wrote a great script, and I'm having a blast illustrating. Superhero that. comic. It's a superhero comic for sure, yes, but it's also it's also a teenage humor comic. Oh, great! This particular issue. I mean, the overall series that um, there was there was a, a mini series that's already come out. So, um, spoiler alert: if you haven't read it, but it's. The concept is basically this character Dragonfly is kind of like Batman. And 
he meets or he actually exchanges universes with a 1960s version of himself called Dragonfly Man, who's sort of like the Adam West version of Batman. So the concept is, what if the Adam West Batman switched universes with the Frank Miller Batman? And so now they're- High concept. Yeah. So now they're interacting in, in each other's universes with each other's villains. So the character who's kind of like the Joker in- in the uh, Adam West Dragonfly Man version is, you know, he robs banks. And the one in the Frank Miller version kills people for looking at him funny. Right, you know, right. Kind of so how does, how does the Adam West Dragonfly Man deal with that, you know? Um, so it was a really fun series. And then Gail kind of picked up where the series left off and, um, so I'm doing like a segment of that where they go into a different universe. What kind of style are you doing that in? Um, that's one of the things I can't really talk about because um, it's sort of oh, okay. um, it's sort of like a, a Easter egg. Got it. I mean, it's one of those fun things that when you hear it, you're like, oh, that's why they got billed to draw that. Oh, okay. <laughs> cool. But I don't want to. I don't want to spoil it for the company. You know, for Ahoy, if they have. Well, when is that going to come out? When can, if we're on the edge of our seat till when? Um, probably February, maybe February or March, I think. Great. Well, do you think maybe you and maybe Gail might want to come here and promote the book? I would Sometime? be happy to. I can't speak for Gail, but yeah, um, yeah, uh, I would love to do Great. that with Gail. Great. Maybe you can help me reach out to her. Yeah. Here's something a lot of people don't know about Gail is um, her first work in comics was actually for Bongo. I think I did know that because I did think she know? mentioned it recent. I think she mentioned it recently in a yeah. um, Twitter or something like that. He wrote, she wrote uh, stories for Bart Simpson. Um, she wrote our newspaper strip. We had a short lived Simpsons newspaper strip that she wrote. Yeah, That's awesome. Yep. That was the first work she got in comics. And then uh, she went on to, you know, bigger and better things. To tell you the truth, though, that was that was my secret (laughs) dream. I was like, if I ever wanted to break into comics, honestly, I wanted to try and write for Bongo and try and write some Simpsons comics. And I thought that would that was just a pipe dream. But here you go. It it worked for Gail. That's amazing. I think Um, she was a hairdresser at the time. So here's so here's Bongo Comics bringing in industry vets and pros helping people come up in the industry, doing great things. I miss Bongo Comics. I, it makes me sad that you guys thought about making a new comics company, but haven't done it. But is it possible that could happen? You know, I, anything's possible. I think, yeah. um, you know, Matt Groening is still very creatively engaged. Um, you know, his focus right now is The Simpsons and Disenchantment. So he splits his time between those two things. But, you know, if Disenchantment ends or The Simpsons ends um, and he's, you know, got time to start thinking about something else, it's I think it's certainly possible. Well, let me just tell you, we'll have room for him when you guys want to come back in here if you start working on a project again. I'll put in a good word. Oh, thanks, Bill. Okay, thank you. You've been so generous with your time. I really appreciate it. I hope we can have you back again sometime soon. I would love it. Thank you, Dan. It's been fun. Fantastic. I'm going to pull you backstage. We're going to play the closing credits pay the bills. If you've got time to stick around, please sure. do. But if, if not, I understand. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Bill. Hey, if, thanks, everybody. Bill stole my line. Thank you, everybody out there for watching this thing. What an interesting guy with an amazing career. This is one of those fellows who's got the all the technical chops, but then also the the people skills and the administrative skills and the and the talent, but most of all, the love of the stuff that he's producing. Can you tell this guy actually loves comics? I think that comes through in everything that he does. All the comics, it came through in this interview. It came through uh, in his work on Mad and, 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 and all his stuff on from Bongo and Zongo. So thanks for checking this out. Um, next week, who have we got? Oh my gosh, coming up next week, we've got, ah, Chris Staros from Top Shelf. That's going to be fantastic. We'll talk about From Hell and 
Monkey vs. Robot and any other book that I can see in this frame here. Many other great books from Top Shelf. Uh, we'll be talking to Chris about that and his all-new comics coaching uh, service that you can pay him to be your coach in comics. Isn't that fantastic? Uh, speaking of comics, what? Come back next time. We'll talk to Chris then. We got a million dollar mailbox. I got a few books queuing up, but I keep getting amazing guests. So I always bump million dollar mailbox for when I can't find a guest. And I've just been getting guest after guest. So remember, you can send your comics in to the million dollar mailbox. Please do send them to million dollar mailbox, PO Box 1163, Arcata, California, 95518. Don't forget to click like and subscribe to this thing and all that other YouTube jazz. And stick around for the end of the closing credit where you're going to see uh, a little cameo at the end of the credit, just like any good comic book movie. This is another one that, uh, oh, I handcrafted myself. So I hope you enjoy it. And we will see you next time.